Hello, welcome to the Monday, November 11th, 2019 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Many of our diaries are talking about how standard Microsoft software can be abused by malicious code in order to essentially assist the code to, for example, download further malicious content. That's often not detected well because these applications are whitelisted and the malicious code is really just using features that these applications provide. On Friday, our handler Xavier wrote about how all of this can be done and also how, for example, you can use your standard Excel to download a file or to execute PowerShell. And uh, attackers that live off the land like this, they of course try to avoid detection. So Xavier is outlining some techniques to detect these misuses of standard Microsoft software. And our handler Jan Kopriva took a look at how the recent use of the Bluekey vulnerability to install crypto miners affected patching practices. Jan's somewhat sad but probably unsurprising conclusion is that uh, the use of the vulnerability in such a highly publicized way did not significantly affect the rate at which systems are patched. Microsoft patched this vulnerability back in May and in the five months since then, there has been a quite strong effort from Microsoft and other organizations to convince people to apply this patch. And well, it's likely that five months into it, the systems that are still not patched are either unmaintained or intentionally unpatched for whatever reasons where administrators figured it's too risky to patch or just too much work. In the past, we have seen the large number of systems that will be patched essentially within days and a couple of weeks of a critical patch being released, but the remaining systems, they can take months or years to get patched and in some cases, I think it more comes down to that these systems will eventually be decommissioned. And the Zero Day Initiative ran another one of its popular pwn to own contests late last week in Japan. The contest lasted two days and included a wide range of devices. One of the first devices to get compromised was a Sony Smart TV. The exploit was a rather normal JavaScript vulnerability in the built-in browser. And actually sort of these JavaScript vulnerabilities were some what a theme here. A similar JavaScript vulnerability was used to compromise an Amazon Echo Show 5. This device was represented in the new home automation category. The first mobile device to fall was a Xiaomi Mi 9 smartphone. Again, a JavaScript issue was used. This time a picture was exfiltrated from the phone. A Samsung Galaxy S10 was also compromised and a picture was exfiltrated from the device. Now for the Samsung phone, the NFC interface was used to gain access and trigger a, again, JavaScript flaw. Part of the event were also a number of home routers and yes, they were also compromised as part of first day of the event. Some of them, however, from the LAN interface. So again, this uh, comes back down to, I keep saying it, do not expose any admin features of these devices to the internet. Another, and this time not JavaScript related exploit, was used to target the Samsung S10 via a malicious base station. The exploit enabled the team to upload a file to the handset. Now, these baseband vulnerabilities are a tricky exploit because you essentially have to set up a cell tower. Now, there is open source software to do this and has been well documented how this can be done with rather modest means. And well, they're also kind of hard to defend against uh, because you can't really pick the network you're connecting to like you're somewhat able with Wi-Fi networks. 
Overall, more than $300,000 were awarded in prices. All vulnerabilities were reported to the respective manufacturers and more detailed write-ups will hopefully be coming once the bugs are fixed. But let's stick with JavaScript for one quick story. And this one is more from a web application point of view. Snick, a company helping to track vulnerabilities in libraries you may be using in your web applications, has released what they call their state of JavaScript framework security. Pretty much all websites these days use one of the major frameworks, but by including megabytes of code in your site, you are also including possible vulnerabilities in these frameworks. And of course, you have to keep them packed. Keeping them up to date can be challenging. Now, just running an older framework does not always mean you are vulnerable. You may not be using the particular vulnerable feature in your code. For jQuery in particular, probably one of the more popular frameworks, Snick pointed out that six out of 10 sites still run a vulnerable version. Well, and that's it for today. Just as a reminder, we made some significant changes to our honeypot these last week or so. So if you're interested in running it, take a look at the code isc.sans.edu slash honeypot.html. That's it for today. Thanks again for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.